position as a whole, what would you say really ails it? Firstly, Padmaja, thank you for having me. And I apologize for being unable to be with um, you in, 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 physically in, in New Delhi. Um, you know, the question of what ails the opposition in many ways, um, as someone who's been a member of the opposition for 10 years, I think one fundamental problem that the opposition has faced over the last decade, since 2014, after UPA limited office and was uh, replaced by the Prime Minister's, um, um, uh, by, by Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji, uh, the opposition has failed to provide any constructive agenda, any constructive suggestions to the people of India, for the people of India. That coupled with the fact that the alliance that we see today in the country is extremely opportunistic. If I look at Maharashtra, for instance, the MVA, the Mahavikas Aghadi, um, because Udhav Thakreji did not get the chief minister's chair in 2019, for the sake of power, for the sake of money, Shiv Sena and Congress did the unthinkable and joined hands. And I think the people see through that that A, there is not a constructive agenda before the people of India, and B, that the only agenda that is uniting all these parties together is to stop Narendra Modi ji from taking India forward. And I really believe that the people of this country, especially the voters, most of whom are young, we have the youngest electorate in the world, they want progress, they are aspirational, they want India to go forward. With social media, with the advent of 4G and 5G, People have access to information around the world. They are aware of India standing globally. And in that sense, to borrow your tagline, India truly is unstoppable. And in that sense, I think the NDA alliance is truly unstoppable. People often talk about Charso Par. I fundamentally believe, based on my own analysis, that I doubt if the Indy alliance will cross even 100 seats. And that tells you the pitiful state of the opposition in the country. That's a, that's a big claim, saying that all of INDI put together will not cross 100. Uh, would you like to put your money on any number for the Congress in particular? Like they're being widely mocked as saying, uh, you know, some people even said that I doubt they will enter double digits, cross even 40. Any number you are willing to wager? I wouldn't want to bet on a, a number, but what I can tell you as someone who knows Mumbai extremely well, who's fought for Lok Sabha elections from Mumbai starting in 2004, Mumbai is all set to elect all six of its MPs to the NDA fold once again. And I, 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 I really fundamentally believe that the people of Mumbai, the people of Maharashtra and the people of India are seeing through this opportunistic alliance where just a few months ago, for instance, the Congress was demanding, was calling what Aam Admi Party had done, the Delhi government's policy as corruption, and that it was calling for arrests, and is now calling arrests unconstitutional, is calling arrests undemocratic. And the same applies in Mumbai and Maharashtra, where till recently, um, Udhav Thakre and the Congress were calling each other all kinds of names. And today they're working together and under just one objective, which is to stop the Prime Minister and stop the Prime Minister from doing something positive for the country, to stop the Chief Minister and the Mahayuti government in Maharashtra from doing something positive for the state. So I think people will see through this. I think Mumbai is all set to elect six MPs. There's not even a doubt in my mind about that. And I honestly doubt, and we'll see that on counting day in June, but I honestly doubt and will be extremely surprised if the India Alliance crosses 100 seats. One more question on Maharashtra before we look at a national overview. We're talking on a day when the Congress and the Shiv Sena are at odds over the seats which have been declared by the Sena UBT. Now you've had, uh, you know, Sanjay Nirupam coming out and saying Shiv Sena has declared their candidate on Mumbai Northwest. I was supposed to fight that seat. You've got even a Varsha Gaikwad who is unhappy with Sangli being given to the Shiv Sena. When you look at what's happening around you right now, is there a sense of despondency given the time and the years you and your family has given to the Congress party or a sense of, I told you so? 
Well, you know, to be honest, now I've moved beyond the point of I told you so. The Congress for me is the past. I'm looking towards the future. I want to contribute in a constructive, positive way. My politics, Padmaja, has always been constructive. Um, I've always wanted to represent Mumbai and Maharashtra. I've always represented Mumbai and Maharashtra and New Delhi. So I, I'm not surprised at what was the sense of despondency in the Congress. I warned the Congress party in 2019 that the MBA alliance is purely opportunistic, purely for the sake of money, purely for the sake of, for all the wrong reasons, and that eventually this will hurt the party's interests. Uh, the, the Congress, I think, refuses to see the writing on the wall. It's frustrating. For, it, it was frustrating for people like me. I have many friends who continue to be in the Congress who I know find it frustrating. But ultimately, as an Indian, rising above party differences, I think as an Indian, I, I'm sure everybody in your audience will agree with me when I say this, that the country wants a strong opposition. The country wants a strong opposition that is also constructive. And I think that is something, at least I hope, that the Congress would aspire to. That is something I hoped this India Alliance would aspire to, to provide constructive suggestions on how we can take the country forward. We are at a unique time in India's history. There are massive geopolitical tailwinds. Um, the world is looking at deleveraging from China. There's a China plus one strategy economically. India has every opportunity before it to take advantage, to provide jobs for our people, to provide national security for our people, uh, to provide growth, economic prosperity. And it's unfortunate, it really hurts me, in fact, as an Indian, that uh, not one constructive suggestion from a party which has a very, a, a very rich legacy also. I mean, when I, when I left the Congress party, I made a statement and I said that this is the party under Narasimha Rao's leadership, under Dr. Manmohan Singh's leadership, that ushered in economic reforms in 1991. Let's not forget that. And in 1991, the economic reforms today, almost 33 years later, who has been the biggest beneficiary of economic reforms? The average Indian, you and I. People have access to mobile services, to better insurance, uh, to better products and services because of economic reforms. And I can give you my own example that in 2016, when the country should, when the Congress party should have celebrated 25 years of India's economic reforms, in 2021, when the Congress party should have celebrated 30 years of economic reforms, it shied away from doing so. It was embarrassed by its own legacy. So unfortunately, the, the party which brought in these constructive ideas to India has moved towards negativity and towards opposing its own legacy. And that's extremely unfortunate. You know, I have to say this. The last three answers, you've used the word opportunist for the Maharashtra Vikas Agadi, and I assume by extension, the entire opposition alliance. Why is it that when the BJP ties up with Eknath Shinde and Ajit Pawar, it's called Chanakya Niti. When they get a Milin Deora and a Jyotiraditya Sindhya, it's a master stroke. But Uddhav Thakre aligns with Congress and Sharad Pawar, then it's opportunist. How, how are the two different? Either both of them are opportunists when, or both of them are Chanakya Niti. Firstly, people from other parties have also joined the Congress. So people have different reasons for leaving a particular organization. Padmaja, in your industry, in the media, it's not that people don't switch from channel A to channel B. Ultimately, everyone, regardless of which profession you're in, whether you're a politician, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a professional working in another sector, you want to feel recognized, you want to feel rewarded, you want to feel empowered, and you want to feel motivated. If, that, if those aspects are taken away in your job and, it, and the purpose for which you joined a particular career, a particular profession, those objectives no longer exist. It's but natural for anyone to seek greener pastures and to seek a place. A greener pasture doesn't mean a place where you may get a post. A greener pasture could mean a place where you feel rewarded, where you feel acknowledged for your talent, where you feel acknowledged for your hard work. And that's precisely the reason someone like me left the party. I tried for 10 years during Congress's most challenging period, during its most difficult decade. I stayed loyal to the party with no post, mind you, no post. Not, uh, not being a legislator, not being a member, uh, uh, having, holding a position in the party for much of that 10 years. I stayed loyal to the party. But I always hoped and I always tried to bring about changes from within. At one point, you reach a stage where you know it's not going to change, and it refuses to change. It refuses to see the writing on the wall. And at that point, you want to be able to contribute. I'm also, mind you, 47 years of age. From the age of 27 to 37, I was in parliament. Congress gave me that opportunity. 
I'm grateful for that. I paid it back from 37 to 47 when, as I said, I stayed with the party during its most difficult decade. But I want to be able to contribute during these years. And I'm, and I'm glad that this is a party where today the, the party that I'm a part of, the leader who I work with, he has a certain vision for Mumbai. He has a certain vision for Maharashtra. Like the prime minister in the center, he too is a self-made man. He too is a man who's come from the, from literally from the ground. He's a man who works night and day, and he has a vision to take the city and the state forward. And that augurs well with my core ideology, which is to take Mumbai and Maharashtra forward. I found that I was suffocated in the Congress, and that's why I had to leave. So when you say opportunism, I think there is a fundamental difference in wanting to be able to be in a platform which allows you to work, which acknowledges your talent, and joining hands purely for the sake of power. And I think that is what the Indie Alliance is doing. Not one constructive suggestion that the Congress, that Aam Aadmi Party, that Shiv Sena can offer this country. Only one suggestion, let's eliminate, uh, let's, let's make sure that Prime Minister Modi ji doesn't come back. And look at the excuses, for instance. They talk about democracy. When the Supreme Court, for instance, uh, strikes down electoral bonds, at that point, the judiciary is working very well for the opposition. When the Supreme Court um, upholds 370, at that point, they'll make a, a criticism that the judiciary is compromised. When they win elections, the EVMs are working fine. When they lose ele elections, EVMs should be scrapped. So this kind of hypocrisy, this is opportunism in my opinion. And this opportunism is what the people will judge in the months ahead, in the weeks ahead. And that's why I'm confident that Indy will not cross 100 seats. Some of the words that you have used, uh, you know, at the time when you left the Congress, and actually before that as well, you had been speaking out periodically, emotional, suffocated, I didn't get respect. From who? An individual, a system, an organization? Who made you feel unseen and suffocated in the Congress? Look, I have moved beyond the Congress. There's no point now talking about the past. Um, I'm looking towards the future. As I said, um, I have no ill will towards anyone. Uh, it, to me, it looks extremely clear that Narendra Modi ji will be the Prime Minister of India once again in June. What I can only hope for Padmaja, and I can only express this, uh, hope to express this through your platform, and I hope that people on the other side will listen, is that India gets a strong and a constructive opposition. To be a strong opposition, to start with, the opposition needs to be stop being destructive, negative, and offer constructive suggestions. I still believe that there are people in the Congress party, many of whom are my close friends. There are some people in the opposition, many of whom I know very well and who I respect, who have good suggestions, who have good ideas. I can only hope that the, the respective parties, including the Congress, allow those people who have their ear to the ground, allow those people who have some domain expertise to rise, to be rewarded, to be acknowledged, to be empowered, so that their suggestions can come to the forefront. And I hope that those who are only there to bicker and only there to present destructive and negative ideas and to be psychophants are pushed to the back. That, in my opinion, will give India the constructive and strong opposition that she desperately deserves. Did you say psychophants? Is that the problem, that there are psychophants and a coterie who are misleading the opposition or at least certain leaders of the opposition? Again, I, I don't want to help too deep into the Congress's, the, the reasons for the Congress's problems. But yes, the, 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 I, I, I found uh, the Congress, uh, what should I say? I found it undemocratic. I found it unopened to constructive suggestions. There were many constructive suggestions I made from 2014 to 2024, all of which are in the public domain, all of which are on my Twitter timeline, all of them are on in the media. Uh, all of which were constructive for the interest of the Congress party, for the interest of the opposition, and ultimately for the interest of India. Um, it's unfortunate that Congress missed that opportunity. And I can only hope going forward, regardless of how many seats they get, I don't think one should be very hopeful about the number of seats that the Congress and the opposition will get. But regardless of the number of seats that the opposition and the Congress get, I hope that they finally learn their lesson after 10 years and three successful de defeats. You know, I'm going to be blunt. 
you i'm sure have seen that uh, you know much much circulated picture where in a frame you jyotiraditya sindhya sachin pilot rpn singh are all in conversation with rahul gandhi inside parliament and of course also because all of you practically began your journey pretty much together 2004 you entered parliament so did mr gandhi you had sachin pilot all of you very young ministers mosas in the manmohan singh cabinet and now it's that picture has become symbolic of you know all people friends fellow travelers falling by the wayside and now talking about what went wrong do you think there was an over reliance on the people in that picture it was a my friends and pals kind of a setup which didn't work in the long run trusting your inner coterie more than the organization again i i i again let me move away from that but my simple point is that if one person had left the party uh, we could call it an aberration if as you mentioned in that photograph with five political leaders if four or five of them had to leave were forced to leave it clearly means something is wrong organizationally something is wrong ideologically uh, something is wrong politically with that organization it clearly means there's a problem and different people left at different times i can speak for myself um i i stayed loyal for 10 years um i i genuinely tried to bring about change from within i was one of those who wrote a letter i would put the famously called the g23 a constructive letter to the party a private letter demanding certain reforms demanding certain changes with the party's best interests in mind unfortunately constructive suggestions even in the even when suggested privately were seen as revolt so beyond the point somebody has to ultimately ask themselves who are they loyal to to a particular party or to the country what is their purpose in politics self preservation or to serve the nation and that's what i had those are the difficult questions i had to ask myself but then i finally realized that ultimately my goal and the reason i entered politics at the young age of 27 the first time that i got elected in 2004 was to serve my city was to serve my state was to serve my country and to bring forth constructive suggestions frankly to bring sides together to bring sides that don't agree on issues the politics that i have been raised seeing very closely by my late father uh, you know he was credited for bringing about the insurance bill in the country which allowed the private sector to come into in, to enter the insurance sector and he worked with then finance minister yashwan sinha who was the finance minister under atal bihari vajpayee and my father was the chairman of the finance committee that's what politics is designed to do bring sides together we bicker we fight we 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 uh, uh, you know attack each other especially during elections but in between elections during those five years the people expect us to work together to get things done and that is where i felt that there was a frustration within the congress i felt that the congress had moved away from 2004 when i entered the party where the congress still held on to the belief that our objective is to bring people together get things done for the sake of the country after that i found the congress on a destructive and negative path where the only goal is to oppose for the sake of opposing unfortunately that is not my politics uh you know i was uh, looking at a few pictures of uh, when you had accompanied mr gandhi i think in 2018 and 2019 to the silicon valley and in 2019 i think just before the elections you possibly gone to singapore now the reason why i ask you this is that many people have actually wondered what is the purpose of these visits a similar visit was undertaken where bang in the middle of this bharat jodo yatra when all the tickets are being announced and everyone's pouring over lists of candidates suddenly he went off to cambridge as somebody who's accompanied on such trips can you tell us what is achieved is the indian electorate being addressed is there another kind of wider political messaging what's the strategy there padmaja i wouldn't know what the strategy is today i know what the strategy was in 2018 when i arranged the first visit to the united states to washington dc to silicon valley to new york city at that time the intention was very clear to present a constructive view of india to keep politics domestic politics within india but to present a constructive idea of india to the world that we are one regardless of our political differences we are one what has happened since then i cannot comment on that i have not been part of arranging those visits and i personally believe that when someone goes abroad when any leader for any political party i've always 
followed that policy from 2004. There were many times in 2004 when as a member of the Congress party, we would go on multi-party delegations abroad and we would go for economic delegations, political delegations. I remember when the Indo-US nuclear deal was being dis discussed, there was a huge controversy. The, the BJP and the Congress weren't seeing eye to eye on it. But when we went overseas and we talked to people, we said, regardless of our political differences, we are united in what benefits India. So that has always been my philosophy. What is the Congress doing today? Who's organizing the visits? What is their agenda for these visits? I cannot comment on. And the reason why this is pertinent is often these visits are called into question as some larger break India agenda. Uh, maybe partially because on some of these visits, for example, the one in London comes to mind a couple of years ago, where Mr. Gandhi had made comments about how there is no democracy in India anymore, the press has been sold out, the judiciary is under duress, as are all other institutions. Would you like to dispel some of the rumors about some great game which is anti-India being uh, you know, fleshed out in those visits? Again, I don't know what, what I, I don't know who is organizing these visits today. I know who has been organizing them in the past few years. But all I can say is that under my watch, I always believe that under my watch, every political leader must present a constructive in agenda when it comes to India. We shouldn't, we don't need foreign powers to come intervene and guide us and tell us what's right and wrong for our democracy. I do believe that India is a healthy democracy. And I think that parties that are undemocratic themselves. Um, have no ability to claim to be able to strengthen or restore democracy in our countries. Parties that are undemocratic, parties that are uh, uh, mon monarchic in nature, how will they restore or strengthen democracy in our country? So I find this a pass, and I find this is something which I personally think that this is, these are just excuses um, that the opposition seems to be making. It's election time. They have to make excuses. They have to set public expectations because they know what's going to happen in the next few months. And I remember in 2014, when the Congress got from 200 and I think six MPs, um, it fell down to 44 MPs. The Congress blamed a whole set of people. 2019, it blamed a whole set of people, institutions. 2024, the same thing will happen. But as long as the Congress does not see the writing on the wall, as long as the Congress fails to reward, acknowledge, uh, bring people who have their ear to the ground, who are talented to the forefront, move towards a meritocratic system, the Congress will continue to make such excuses. Now, uh, other than being a politician, a former minister, you're also a very accomplished musician. For those who do not know, I actually want to play out a clip of uh, Milindyora at uh, the Blues Festival a couple of years ago. Uh, you're also part of a band which is called Third Degree. First, let's take a look at that uh, performance by Mr. Deora. You know, from that lifestyle to this, your band is called Third Degree. Some people say working in the BJP Shiv Sena is in itself Third Degree. How are you going to balance the two? Well, firstly, I hope your audience hasn't left the room watching that long clip. They haven't actually. Uh, a dozen of them walked in. <laughs> well, music is a part of my life. Music will never go away. And as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm still the same person I always was. 
the the the, the Shiv Sena led by Eknath Shinde ji has. Uh, he's he's very clear in what he expects from me. My, he he he's very clear in that he's asked me to uh, represent Mumbai, to represent Maharashtra. Uh, shortly after I joined the party, I was in Davos. I saw how hard he worked to bring investments to to Maharashtra, to bring jobs to Maharashtra. I saw the kind of competition in Davos where different states are competing. So these are areas, Padmaja, which I'm good at, and this is how I hope to serve my city, my state, and my country. Uh, music is obviously a passion that will never go away. Certainly, the system is certainly a very hardworking system. Um, it's a, certainly a very um, a, a demanding system. We are obviously in the midst of the election period, so the guitar is the strings are getting rusty right now. But I'm sure I'll have time in the months and years ahead to pick it up again. But you know, the image of the Shiv Sena is you know it's a grassroots party, the shakhas, the rallies, and blues and jazz is a slightly more elevated pursuit. Don't you think that is going to be in the mind of the Sena voter? Ye kaise neta aa gaya? I don't think so. I don't. I don't see that at all. And I think that um, you know, I think Mum the, the Sena represents in many ways Mumbai's ethos, and Mumbai's ethos is extremely diverse. Mumbai has thrived. Mumbai has become, has been, and remained the economic capital, the cultural capital, uh, the creative capital of India because of its diversity. And every community, regardless of which language you speak, regardless of which community you belong to, regardless of which state you've come from, uh, the, the 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 Sena has always given that representation to people, believe it or not. And so, and I think Mr. Shinde is an extremely, what should I say, a, a, a very modern politician. He's somebody who has a very grand vision for the city. He has a very grand vision for the state. He's somebody, as I said, who's very demanding, very hardworking. Um, somebody who, who's cut from the same cloth as the prime minister. Uh, the prime minister was a chaiwala who rose to become prime minister purely based on his hard work and his dedication. The chief minister, for those who don't know, was an auto rickshaw driver, uh, a three wheeler driver in in Thane, and he rose based on his hard work to become chief minister of Maharashtra. So, so I'm I'm excited by the prospect of working with a man like him. In a party like the Shiv Sena, and they've given me a lot of space, and I think they want different opinions to come together. They want people from different backgrounds to come mm -hmm. together, and you'll see many more people from different backgrounds, from different walks of life, from different communities, joining us, working um, <clears throat> shoulder to shoulder with us in the months ahead. Final question: You're in the Rajya Sabha, yet you are taking public meetings in South Mumbai. Are you going to fight the Lok Sabha elections? Many Rajya Sabha members have. Are you going to do the same? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, the, the chief minister has sent me to the Rajya Sabha. Yes, that's true. And I've recently been elected. I have yet, I've yet to take oath. Uh, I hope to do that next week when the Rajya Sabha term begins. It begins on April 2nd. But ultimately, the goal of this alliance in Maharashtra is to ensure that every seat goes to the NDA and every seat strengthens the prime minister's hand. So if the alliance, if the chief minister, if my party decides that I should fight the Lok Sabha election from South Mumbai, I'm more than ready to do so. Uh, this is a constituency where my family has, my family has been fighting elections, mind you, Padmaja, from 1980, nonstop. My father fought the, the, the Lok Sabha elections from 1980 to 1999. I fought the elections from 2004 to uh, 2019, four elections. So this is a constituency which we know very well. We know the back of our hand. Uh, we have a very uh, wide network uh, cutting across communities. Um, and so, as I said, if this is something that the party and the alliance wants me to do, I'm more than happy to do that. The ultimate goal, as I said, is to ensure that every seat in Mumbai, every seat in Maharashtra goes to the NDA, which I'm very confident will happen. And if I'm, if the alliance feels I'm the best candidate to achieve that objective, I'm more than ready and more than eager to do so. So I will take that as a yes. And let's hope maybe this time at the Dashera rally, we'll have a blues and jazz festival as well. <laughs> Thanks very much, Milan Deora. Blues Pleasure and jazz, as but always. maybe the guitar. Thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for the Member of Parliament? Thanks for joining us.